So this is um, a little bit a continuation from uh, uh, the first lecture, uh, where I gave an overview um, about um, uh, ancient solutions uh, and eternal solutions to geometric flows. So for you that um, uh, were not there in the first lecture, I'm going to say just a few words. And, um, and so today I will discuss in a little bit more detail the problem uh, of uniqueness uh, of ancient solutions to mean curvature flow. But, um, and, um, okay, so, so let me just remind you or for, for, for you that you were not here on, um, on Tuesday, what is the definition of an ancient solution? A solution is ancient, uh, we call it that it's ancient, a solution to a parabolic equation <coughs> is ancient if it's defined for all time from minus infinity up to capital T. And in the special case where capital T is plus infinity, then the solution is called eternal. So it lives, it has lived forever and it will live forever. I think. Uh, in principle, you have no boundness. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so you missed uh, the lecture on the, yes, the lecture on Tuesday, and uh, we talked even about e to the t. It was into the e to the x plus t. So, and uh, the heat equation. Uh, no, in principle you don't, but uh, sometimes you want to impose because uh, uh, a lot of times in this class, uniqueness result, uh, your eternal solution comes from uh, some limits uh, or in singularities uh, where, for example, you have some a priori and uh, you scale by the, by the maximum and you have some a priori control on the infinity norm, etc. A priori, though, no, although usually sometimes the curvature goes up, uh, so as you go back, the curvature goes down, but how much down is a problem. Okay, I will, uh, I will talk a little bit. Actually, this has to do with the second or, or the third, uh, the third slide. So, as I said last time, um, typical examples of ancient solutions are the self-similar solutions, the solitons, and uh, in geometry, geometric flows, what comes all the time, of course, are the contracting spheres, which is the simplest case of a shrinking solid or expanding, depending on the flow. The cylinders, again, the cylinders may shrink, expand, or stay the same. For example, in the Gauss curvature flow, they stay the same. And some other complete non-compact solitons, for example, the cigar soliton in the Ricci flow and other solitons in the Yamabe flow where they have cylindrical ends on one side and they are shrinkers, they can be expanders, all sorts of different um, objects. And as we talked last time, a picture that comes very often is something like the table in front, actually I was thinking, the table of the front office of the field is, it looks a little bit like this, it's like an oval. And, um, and you have uh, two solitons at uh, the tips and you are connected by a cylinder. Of course, this is a very rough picture, you may have intermediate regions, etc. And these uh, are obtained uh, usually, this is a picture close to negative infinity, of course, because as you go forward, uh, they tend to uh, become, um, some of them round, uh, etc. Okay, now, um, so the goal is to, uh, to ask the question, try to characterize ancient uh, or eternal solution which satisfies some geometric condition. Those geometric conditions often have to do with uh, a curvature bound, like bound uh, an L infinity norm of the curvature, for example. That's why uh, we distinguish the solution in type 1 and type 2. Because usually what you want to say is, 
after I rescale the flow, as t approaches minus infinity, because if I don't rescale, it will be maybe a very big object. But after I rescale, I have something bounded. So this, uh, if you do the typical scaling, uh, and you get the uniformly bounded curvature after you do the typical scaling, then the solution is type 1. Again, this has to do with minus infinity, not with the singularity. And it's type 2 if at some points or everywhere, usually happens at some points, you have, uh, after scaling, you have larger curvature than the typical one. So usually, like after scaling, the curvature blows up at some points. And another condition is the so-called non-collapsing condition, which I explain and I will explain in a second in the context of the mean curvature flow. Okay, and uh, we will be talking only for today, from now on, about the mean curvature flow. But because the curve shortening is just the 1D mean curvature, Gauss curvature flow, let me just briefly again discuss uh, uh, this case. So everybody knows what is the curve shortening flow. You evolve a curve, which is the, in this case, is the boundary of the yellow region. And for the purposes of, of these next two slides, uh, this um, uh, curve is embedded in the plane and you embed, you evolve it by the curvature kappa. And uh, kappa, it satisfies a very nice evolution equation. Is kappa sub t is kappa s s plus kappa to the cube. Now this looks a little bit too innocent uh, because this kappa s s, s is the arc length, which of course involves the curve itself and the metric. But if you have a convex curve, then you can parameterize by an independent variable, like you can write your curve over if you have a closed curve as a periodic, um, a kappa as a periodic function of period 2 pi, and you end up with this beautiful mixer of semilinear and porous medium equation. And in the case of the curve shortening flow, you have examples of type 1 and type 2, and the type 1 is just a contracting circles, and the type 2 are the unguinate ovals of paper clips, which have this beautiful form, kappa square, which, as I explained last time, it's what we call pressure in this case. It's kind of a natural quantity to consider. It's just a function of time plus a function of space. And it's an older result with a um, joint result with Hamilton and Sassoon, that under convexity, the only ones are the only ancient solutions of uh, curve shortening flow are these two. So in principle, for a parabolic equation, under reasonable condition, you expect not to have so many, especially if the equation is nonlinear. And therefore, if something was too big, maybe it would have blown up or as it goes as you go forward. And as I explained last time, you may say, okay, why you uh, assume convexity? Actually, the reason why the PD question is, uh, as, is because then we just deal with, uh, with uh, this simple case, uh, periodic solutions uh, uh, of period to kappa of this very nice equation that they are ancient and we classify them. But actually, uh, there is another reason uh, if you assume, if you don't uh, assume convexity in curve shortening and even in more so in mean curvature, you may have weird examples. And this is one example that uh, it's a YouTube video that Anginen has put up. And uh, so this guy winds more and more as t approaches minus infinity. So as t goes to minus infinity, the number that it winds uh, becomes infinity. And um, so you can have a weird um, subject. Okay, in kind of pathological situation, maybe you don't really care about classifying this case. All right, so for the, next, for the rest, I'm going to be discussing 
um, ancient and convex actually solution of the mean curvature flow, which is already a little complicated. So let me remind you again what is the mean curvature flow. Okay, you have uh, some surface, and I was saying yesterday too that the reason everything looks convex is because I don't know how to how to draw a nice non-convex surface We're using like simple tools. But in this purpose, the purpose of the talk today, the guys will be convex. And um, so anyway, you consider a compact surface and dimensional embedded in Rn plus one, which you move by mean curvature. And okay, this is a little bit bad notation uh, because sometimes we have new to be the outer normal, so I put here a negative sign. Uh, a convex, uh, a convex um, surface evolving by mean curvature goes inward. For Gauss, as for uh, uh, inverse mean curvature we did yesterday, it was going out. And the problem is to understand the ancient compact solutions uh, of this. And now, um, in some cases, of course, what you end up with the singularities, um, in singularities, uh, they are solitons. And uh, there is a, a lot of work which has been done to understand the solitons, uh, which are the self-similar solutions for mean curvature flow, which is not actually easy itself, the question itself. But in general, for ancient, no, for ancient solutions, there is a notion of uh, alpha non-collapsed or non-collapsed condition, which was introduced by Weming Shen and Suji Wang, and independently by Ben Andrews, which I explained also last time. It says somehow that uh, some, your body, which is the, your surface, which is the boundary of uh, your body, uh, satisfies uh, inside, like at each point of the surface, we have an analysis term, an exterior interior ball condition, but the radius of the ball is inverse proportional to the mean curvature at that point, and that constant here, for an ancient solution, you want to be uniformly bounded from above and below, so, um, especially from below, so uh, that's the condition. And um, there is a beautiful work by Robert Hasselhofer and Kleiner where, okay, they study many things, uh, but uh, in particular they show that, uh, and in this paper, but in particular they show that uh, if your ancient compact and alpha non-collapsed, then you are convex. So, it's non, yes, exactly. Yes. It doesn't satisfy. <coughs> yes. And for example, for the mean curvature flow, there is this. Um, there are these ancient solutions that they look like pancakes as the approaches minus infinity. Uh, so it's more or less uh, they look like uh, grim reapers that they are rotated, and these are also collapsed. It's a. Uh, yes. Uh, in uh, in some cases, yes. In some cases, uh, in some cases, yes, we know. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Ah, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes, the picture is not accurate. The picture is, uh, uh, is uh, yes, and actually this is just one. This is. No, no, no. I think it's okay, but this means uniformity as t goes to minus infinity. Yes. Yes. That's the whole point. Yes, yes, uniform in time, of course. Yes, yes. Because it's compact, so it will be like these guys are compact. If so it's smooth, if it's smooth, I mean, curvature flow, everything will be smooth because you have the smoothing effect. It's not like Gauss curvature. Yeah. Okay, 
So now, uh, now if um, uh, right, um, we also know it's not hard to show that if it's convex, compact, and self-similar, then uh, we have the spheres. So what we are interested in is to look at uh, alpha non-collapse, compact, therefore convex, uh, solutions of the mean curvature flow which are not self-similar. Therefore, they're not the spheres. And uh, by the way, I will put it in the next uh, slides, uh, slide. Um, um, uh, Robert and Herskovitz, um, they also have given a characterization, uh, different like conditions which will guarantee for an ancient um, uh, convex, uh, uh, an ancient solution to be the sphere. So one of the characteristics, right, so of course one is to be self-similar, but the other ones. Okay, so now we would like to discuss uh, the problem of classification of these ancient ovals. Now, unfortunately, uh, we don't know that they are rotationally symmetric, and this is still an open question. So most of the talk today will have to do with rotationally symmetric objects. So it's an open question whether they are rotationally symmetric. Yes, I mean, you will see. You will see. In the, we will know exactly how they look. Don't worry. Uh, so... So this, uh, so because we know the mass asymptotics exactly. So uh, Brian White in 2003 sketched the proof of uh, the existence of uh, solutions that as t approaches minus infinity look like this. Actually, they don't really look exactly like this. It's just because I'm not good in drawing pictures. But uh, anyway, actually, they are... They are, okay. they are convex and they look, I will, I will show you the, the asymptotics. So, and, um, and, uh, Robert and Herskovitz, uh, they provide a more detailed construction, uh, about, uh, of these solutions in 2013 and also establish some properties of this. So, because, uh, Brian White was the first one, or at least Okay, I know maybe it's other people uh, to, to, pr to show us the existence, we'll be calling them the white ovals. And so and in this talk, ancient ovals will be something that we don't necessarily, they're not necessarily this. We would like more or less to show that under rotation, we would like to show that under the non-collapse condition and compactness, the only ones are uh, the, the ancient, the only ancient ovals are the white ovals, right? So the only non-self-similar collapse, non-collapse things are these. But of course, we don't know that they're rotationally symmetric. Okay, and uh, now in 2012, Angenent um, provided uh, the, mass, the formal mass asymptotics of these ovals, which showed okay, where is that? that there are three regions, which we will understand very well in a second, because we, we know the exact asymptotics, is the cylindrical region, the tip region, where cylindrical means you see the cylinder after rescaling, at the tip, uh, very close to the tip, at a different scale at which you see the cylinder, you see the ball soliton, the translating soliton, and then you have a pretty long intermediate region where you see an ellipsoid. Ah, wrong direction. Okay, so, um, so for for the most of the talk, I will be discussing um, ancient convex solutions, because they're non-collapsed, which have an O1 cross O1 symmetry. So therefore, they are rotationally symmetric around an axis, which means that the problem has one variable in X. And um, under of the convexity assumption, and so you can write uh, your surface, uh, right, uh, this is the radius uh, of which you rotate, as a function of x, of so displacement and t, and you have this simple PDE. And as t approaches minus infinity, u becomes very large, 
So to see the cylinder, you need to perform a type 1 scaling, the same scaling you do for the spheres, which is um, the same scaling, actually, that it's necessary to uh, make um, the, uh, the solution to be bounded near the singularity, because forward, you're going to contract. Uh, it, it will become the sphere as it contracts. Okay? <coughs> so if uh, capital T is the time at which uh, uh, forward you, you contract to a point, right, because it's a compact solution, you can perform this scaling. Um, and um, so little u is the new function. Capital U is the old function, right? So you make it smaller as t approaches plus infinity, right? Minus infinity. As t approaches minus infinity, this becomes huge. So therefore, little u is uh, 1 over something, right? And uh, so and then you stretch, uh, um, you make also the variable uh, y. So this means that you rescale your whole surface by you, by you shrink it by 1 over square root of t minus t. And uh, you also perform this typical change in the, um, in time. Uh, this is very common in this type 1 scaling. So our time from now on, it will not be t, but it's going to be tau, which is going to be minus log of capital T minus t. And therefore, it will be the new little y will be from minus infinity to plus infinity. All right? But if you didn't know exactly at which capital T you shrink to a point, you could view it's okay. You could view capital T as a parameter of the problem. And But the only thing then, okay, you have rescaled the wrong way. This means that the solution may blow up still in some finite time, right? Your little u, or may vanish as tau approaches infinity. Uh, we don't really care because our uniqueness will come from minus infinity. I mean, we care to fix the parameter, and you're going to see in the proof how we fix the parameters, but we can even view this as a scaling parameter, right? As a, as a translation, this capital T plays the role of translation. It's a free parameter, which means translation in the original time T. Okay. And they rescale you satisfies this equation. Now this, if you didn't have this 1 plus u y square, this is quite uh, well known for to the people. This operator is very well known for the people that they do this type, like semi-linear parabolic equations, etc. But of course, here we have this 1 plus y u square that comes from min Kerbach's law. All right. So what we first did, so the rest uh, of uh, what I would be talking today is a joint work with uh, Singur Angenent and Natasha Sesu. So this is uh, this was one of the first examples, actually the first example I know, but maybe there are others, that uh, we would like to prove uniqueness, but we don't have the exact formula for the solution. Like uh, in the Angenent uh, ovals, uh, 1D or each 2D Ricci flow, we know the solution explicitly. So the uniqueness has to come from something else. So you, you will, at the, how the proof will go, you will really try to show that if you have two solutions, right, and you fix your parameters, they have to be the same. But you need to start from somewhere. And of course, the only thing you can start, okay, you may say, okay, I will start at the final time, that's an idea, but okay, at least uh, how are you going to distinguish between the spheres and the cylinders? Anyway, so what we thought, at least the proof we thought, is to try first to establish the asymp exact asymptotics at minus infinity so that we know in some sense the two solutions are kind of close to each other at minus infinity and then try to prove uniqueness as you go forward, right? So that's, of course, uh, it's, uh, everybody will think about it. It's not nothing so precise. Now, in our work, though, I have been telling to my collaborators, please, let's try to use this mass asymptotics of minus infinity as less as possible, because, of course, to prove this mass asymptotics is usually painful, right? But unfortunately, we had to use them quite a lot. So anyway, so the first uh, thing we did 
is we try to establish both uh, more geometric properties, more precise geometric properties than uh, the ones that uh, um, Robert and Herskovitz had uh, established about uh, the solutions, and also uh, establish uh, better asymptotics as T approaches minus infinity. Now, we assumed O1 cross O1 symmetry. Now, to extend this, uh, our result to OL cross OK symmetry, okay, I'm not saying that it's the same proof, but I wouldn't be surprised if, like, it's, like, there are just a couple of points where our proof fails. Um, it makes, it makes a lot of sense and maybe it's not so difficult. Now, of course, to prove that any without radial symmetry, you have this asymptotics, this, um, uh, we don't know how to do. Questions? Okay. Now, I will tell you, I will give you the asymptotics uh, soon, but let me just tell you first uh, what it follows uh, from our exact asymptotics. From our exact asymptotics, we have a pretty good estimate. I mean, this is a pretty good estimate for the diameter of our solution as t approaches minus infinity and for the maximum curvature. And if you remember, we have these ovals, right? They, so the di this is the diameter. And now we know, it's not hard to show, that the maximum curvature is attained at the two tips. All right? Um, and, um, okay. And uh, I will, um, so I will give you the asymptotics. Now I'm not going to discuss how we prove this. Uh, it's a little complicated, so, but uh, how we did the asymptotics. Maybe I will say a word in a second. But, um, so anyway, so given these asymptotics, uh, as uh, this is something I have discussed already, the open problem is to establish the unique and the general case. And, uh, uh, there are two, con okay, two conjectures. The first one is, to, of course, two problems here. Uh, of course, there can be one problem if you can do all at once. Uh, but uh, one is to show that um, uh, that everything has an, uh, is um, um, uh, that to show the rotational symmetry and then prove the uniqueness. Okay, now. Um, the theorem that uh, we recently shown, uh, we have we have been checking all the last details, and we should post it soon. Um, is that uh, if you have an ancient oval with O1 cross O n symmetry, uh, then uh, 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 this is unique up to the two parameters that we have, which is scaling and translation, uh, the scaling and translating the original time t, the time t, the tau and t. Remember, we will be working with tau, but this t. And so, therefore, the only ones that they have, we have in this case is the, uh, the, the white uh, ovals. Now, uh, you know, for both, the uniqueness and um, and the asymptotics that, that we proved. Uh, let me first show you the asymptotics ah, backwards. Let me first um, uh, show you um, uh, show you a little bit the asymptotics, and then uh, I will tell uh, a little bit uh, just a word on how we proved. Uh, um, okay, the idea for the proof first of the estimate, the, um, as, the mass asymptotics, and then of course uh, I will discuss the uniqueness. So, as um, we knew from the maths asymptotics, there are three regions. There is the parabolic region, the intermediate region, and the tip region. And unfortunately, we have to divide uh, um, uh, the tip region in two subregions. But for this, uh, for the purposes uh, of this, uh, uh, forget about this. And, um, okay, let me just show you first. So forget about this slide for a moment. I think this should come first. So this came first anyway. So what our asymptotics show is that u, little u is the rescaled. We have already rescaled. We have rescaled in such a way that 
Now we can assume that as D approaches minus infinity, on compact sets as least, we see the cylinder. Okay? Um, right. That we know. Okay? So we start from that. This was known. Okay? We have excluded the case of the spheres now, so we just, we see the cylinder. This uh, you can easily prove. And now, uh, what is the cylinder? It's a constant. All right? So in the parabolic region, which is the region where you see the cylinder, you see, of course, the constant, which is the cylinder, and then you see a next order term, right? So this is the hardest part to obtain, uh, in some sense, is this second order asymptotics. Big ah, um, so, ah, you know what? I changed, okay. Very good. You pay attention. I made a mistake. So, you see, okay. So, the first thing we showed is that for every L, L was, uh, for every L is just compact sets in Y. This term is the size of Y. So, actually, what we proved. Yes. So, let me just uh, draw a picture. So, this is the rescale object, and this is Y, and this is U. Right? So you, y plays the role, right? Y is just the variable y, and this is u. Just as simple. And it's, uh, so you are viewing your solution from here to here. Okay? And at, in the middle, in the middle, I, I, I will have a picture in a second. In the middle, you see the cylinder. And then at the tips, you see the soliton, but at a very different scale. So here, I almost don't, we almost don't see it. And then for the long region here, you see an ellipsoid. All right? So this is exact. So this is the ellipsoid in the rescale variable. Because now you see, you know, to see, because this is already from here to here, right? So now this is tau. So u here, u is a function of y. Y is already what I have rescaled, and tau. It's not t anymore, it's tau. And it's not x, it's y. Okay? And under this, it's not capital U, it's little u. Under these rescalings, right, uh, u in the middle converges to constant. That's how you do the rescaling, right? And, uh, but the thing becomes longer and longer as tau approaches minus infinity. How long? We know exactly from here to here, and actually I will be calling this D, not this from here to here, like uh, the diameter will be 2D. So from here to here, it's a little confusing, from here to here is square root of 2D. Okay? Tau is log of T. Okay? Um, right. So, and Y is 2, uh, right? And so you will see here, so... So this is the key of the matter. The matter. So this is exactly the, the the hardest thing to prove, and that's what gives us the estimates. Why? Because you see that you right these asymptotics hold. Actually, actually this is this. In some sense, parabolic and intermediate regions are not so different because. Uh, in the, these asymptotics that we have for the parabolic region, this is more or less, if you call z to be, uh, y squared over 2 tau, okay, this is exactly the asymptotics that you get here, alright? So somehow the parabolic and the intermediate, if they're more or less the same idea, right, the same, uh, the same region, but we, we have to treat them differently. And so this is L, uh, okay, at the, because at the beginning you know that this you only have on compact sets in Y, for Y less than L, but then you can extend it that you have it up to Y, which, which is little order of square root of that, right? So this plays the role. Okay, so your parabolic region, and you, right, uh, your parabolic region is, a, is the region where somehow you see exactly the constant, right? And then you start curving away, and the intermediate region is uh, the long region. And then you see that when y is, y squared is 4 tau, this will vanish. And that's exactly, that's exactly what is going on up to lower order. Up to lower order, the tip lies on, uh, at the region where y squared over 4 tau is more or less 1. Right? So this is uh, asymptotic. 
And so the intermediate region is this, and the tip region, it happens after the scale. So you see, to see the cigar, because usually to see the, to see something at the tip, you need to rescale by the maximum curvature. And the maximum curvature, as the curvature here, as T approaches minus, I haven't drawn it nice, but as T approaches minus infinity, the guy becomes longer and longer, so the curvature here uh, grows like one over square root of time. Okay. And therefore, you see the, and this is a, oh, this guy. Now, the hardest part here, like, okay, so, and I don't want to, so everything, the, how, and why, why do you have here y squared minus 2 over 4 tau? Of course, if you, if you know how to do mass asymptotics, right, how do you do the mass asymptotics? You linearize around the cylinder, and then uh, you look at the projections into the different uh, elements of the spectrum and what uh, uh, of the linearized operator. And then uh, this y squared minus 2 is the element of the kernel. This is like the eigenfunction corresponding to the zero eigenvalue. So it's the element of the kernel, and that's what it gives. Now, of course, this, like, okay, if you do mass asymptotics, this is very simple to do. You do it in an hour. Now, the hard part here, what uh, the difficulty, of course, is that you're dealing with a non-compact uh, object. And if you want to see, um, <clears throat> uh, if you want to do this calculation rigorously, you need to pass some cutoff functions in the parabolic region, right? To, to isolate somehow the parabolic region. And, um, and, um, to, in order to be able to isolate, to, to be able to isolate the parabolic region, you have to work. And for that, we had to use Huygens monotonicity formula. And once you isolate the parabolic region and you create this nice, uh, term here, then you need to deal with the intermediate region and we do that passing, uh, constructing very precise barriers. So this is just to prove the asymptotics. Okay, so for the moment, let's assume that we do have the asymptotics. So we know now that any solution, not just the ones that uh, Robert constructed, but any solution, uh, satisfies these asymptotics, at least any solution with rotation symmetry. And now we would like, of course, in particular, the white ovals satisfy this, but not just the white ovals, any other one satisfies this. And now we would like to show that if you have two solutions that satisfy these asymptotics at minus infinity, then you can fix your parameters, trans the translation and dilation in original time, to make them the same. Okay. And so, right, and so... Um, okay, I don't think this is so important. We will get into more detail. So, and this is, um, these are the regions that I talked to you about. Is the parabolic region, the intermediate region, and then the tip region, which unfortunately we have to, uh, to deal a little bit separately because, okay, you have the soliton region, which corresponds to where you see exactly the soliton, compact sets on the soliton in the new scale. And the color always, uh, uh, that's the reason you, where you create problems, is the region in between, where you have arbitrary large sets near the soliton. But what we prove, actually, which I have at the end, is a, a, something like, a, we call it a cylindrical estimate, which somehow says that, it's not hard to prove, uh, it's that away from the soliton region, right, Lambda 1, which is the minimum eigenvalue, over lambda 2, which is, let's say, the maximum, or h, lambda 1 over h, and um, it's very small. So you know that uh, away from the solid, what you expect, uh, but we prove it and helps us as in the proof, is that for any solution, if you are away from the solid region, right, then it's pure cylindrical, more or less, okay? All right. All right, so now the outline of the proof, and I, don't worry, I will finish so early today. Uh, the outline of the proof is uh, you have two solutions, and you would like to show that modulo these 
transformations that they are the same. Okay, so, um, and all right, you don't really need to pay so much attention to that, but we will be having these two parameters, beta and gamma. Beta is a translation in time, and gamma is a dilation in time. Okay, all right. Um, and, um, and the theorem claims that uh, if you take, you give me any two solutions, U1 and U2, because a priori you don't know, all of them satisfy our, uh, our assumptions at minus infinity. I can choose the beta and the gamma, I can change the second one, and therefore the, uh, and so that they are the same. Okay. And you don't care about this, but I just uh, wrote it down. So this, uh, in terms of little u, the effect of beta and gamma is all this. Okay, it doesn't really matter what it is for you. Okay, so of course, we look at the difference of the two solutions. So you call w to be u1 minus u2 with these two parameters, beta and gamma. And we have part of the game is fixing these two parameters, right? And uh, so how we're going to fix, of course, you, you can imagine these two parameters come from the spectrum, from the bad modes in the spectrum of the linearized operator. Okay. Now, the hard part, of course, always comes from the fact that we have three regions we, which we need to treat separately because we, at the end, our uniqueness, the idea is that at the end, the uniqueness is going to come from the middle, from the parabolic region. So, so, at this point, you already know the three regions. We know because we proved our asymptote. Okay. The asymptote is whole for any solution. We have the three regions with our good asymptotics. That's not a problem. And each region has to be treated separately. Actually, now we think that if it's going to work, uh, just give me one moment, is actually we are rewriting, okay, we, it may not work, but actually to make it simple, we might be able to treat uh, parabolic and intermediate all at once because they are more or less cylindrical. But anyway, uh, question. Yes, yes, yes. So, no, translating in time and dilating in time. Right? So, yes, I mean, no, but I dilate space, too. I, I mean, I, you know, I do a rescaling in space and time. I, I, right, I rescale space and time, and then, I, sorry, I rescale space and time, and then I translate time. Right? Sorry, I, I mean, every time I rescale time, I have to tr rescale right? Phase two. Okay. So, um, all right. So, and this is the way I do. Right? Of course. Exactly. I have gotten rid. So, I have only two modes. Under no symmetry, I will have more. And if I had OK cross OL symmetry, I had more too. Yes, I agree. So, okay. So, now to distinguish. So, right. So, at the end, um, our uniqueness will come from the middle, but we need to take care of everything else. So, and of course, you, you, you cannot hope that everything, you can isolate the middle, because uh, you have other solutions, right, that they don't close at the tip. So you have to use that you have your solution, which has the special, very, very special behavior at the tip. Okay. So you have to use everything, in other words, or at least uh, at the, in some sense. Okay, so we introduce these three cutoff functions, and we multiply. So phi, parabolic, intermediate, and tip. And they have some overlap, of course, and, uh, right, so there is some overlap, which will help us, of course, uh, deal, because at the end, uh, we don't take them as partition of unity, just cutoff functions. Okay, now... Uh, in the parabolic regions, let's first look uh, at WP, which is the difference. W is always now the difference of the two solutions multiplied by the characteristic of uh, phi sub t. Like, so we concentrate now on the, um, uh, on the parabolic region. 
So we linearize, of course, then we know that in the parabolic our solution is, any, any of any solution is like the cylinder. So therefore, uh, you write them as uh, L of WP, where L is just a linearization of the cylinder, an operator that we know very well, plus error terms, okay. And then now, because of our asymptotics, here is where we are using, of course, the asymptotics, is we know that this is kind of small, right? Okay. And now this, uh, we look at, uh, uh, because of this minus y over 2, by, uh, the right uh, weight space is this uh, Gaussian, right? This, um, uh, the integrate, you, the L2 space is with respect to this Gaussian. And of course, this helps because uh, a way it, uh, it gives us something that works. But anyway, I don't know if it helps so much. This hurts, but so it's the same. So, and now you do have uh, this linear operator has one element uh, in its kernel, uh, one positive eigenvalue, and the rest are good eigenvalues. So we write, we, let's say P, uh, okay, calligraphic plus, minus, and zero are the orthogonal projection into the unstable. Unstable is the positive. Stable is the good one, the negative, the many ones, and neutral is the element of the curve. And we will, of course, take, we take an L2 norm in space and time. Uh, in space is with respect to the Gaussian, and in the time, you take the supremum and from sigma minus one to sigma, all the way to minus infinity. Okay. And you prove, given that you know some good estimates about your error terms, right? You prove, uh, you can estimate the error term in terms of an epsilon, and this is WP, whatever you have in the parabolic regions, but then, of course, the problem always is that uh, when you cut... Uh, we, because of the cutoff function, you introduce some errors which have to, they look like W multiplied by derivatives of your cutoff function, and that uh, involves a little bit of the intermediate region where you cut. So you cannot estimate in WP. That's always the problem, of course. Okay. And uh, so the main estimate in the parabolic region is that Nevertheless, you can estimate W hat. What is WP hat? It's just uh, everything but uh, the projection towards the kernel, which will dominate at the end. So the theorem, the, the main estimate here is just that in the parabolic, you can estimate uh, WP minus the projection to in the kernel in terms of uh, epsilon the WP plus WI, okay? If we didn't have the WI here, we'll be more or less done because this estimate says that what dominates is the element, the projection towards the kernel. And then, of course, you go back and find an ODE for the projection of the kernel for the P0 WP, which we'll be calling it as alpha of T, and you're done. But unfortunately, you have this WI, so you have to keep estimating. All right. So, okay. So, um, so we have this. All right. And so what we need is that we can estimate back the, the difference in the intermediate. Actually, this is not just the inter this is just a smaller region than the intermediate, but it doesn't really make any difference. So the difference of the two solutions in the intermediate, in the right norm, in terms of a constant over tau naught, tau naught is very large, so this is very tiny, the norm of the parabola. If we prove this, then we are in very good shape because we can get rid of this. Right? Because we can absorb the WI and WP. Right? Actually, we don't even need uh, small. We can even, we prove small, but even a constant will be enough. Okay. So if I combine these two, then I have this estimate. 
So I, in a moment, like for the next two slices, I'm going to indicate how you prove this, which of course gave us some trouble, and this gave us uh, most of the trouble. And once we have this, I will show you, then we have this, and therefore uh, we can finish our argument, okay? So to prove this, all right, you need, of course, to keep doing the estimates. You have to go all the way to the tip because we need to use that your solution is closing because if your solutions don't close, there's no. All right, so I remind you that W is the difference of our two solutions, and now we concentrate in the intermediate region. And we do the same. I'm not going to bore you. Um, we prove that you can estimate the norm in the intermediate in terms of a little bit of the norm in the parabolic and a little bit of the more norm on the region near the tip, the collar region where you put your cutoff functions. All right, every time. Now, how you prove that? Now, in the in this case, you more or less um, in the intermediate region. Of course, you don't know exactly the operator, but it's almost the same operator. And you prove it by establishing a Poincaré type inequality and an energy inequality in this combined. So you prove this estimate. And again, it's the same norm. So this, we think, actually, we can even do it in one step. So in the parabolic, we can just say that the parabolic can extend all the way to the soliton. So that's not a problem. Now, in the soliton, you have a little bit of a technical problem. You cannot work in the, so now we are in this region, somehow in the region that we are very close to the T, where U is very small. But now, things get, uh, you cannot use the same chain, the same coordinates anymore because things turn vertical. So you need to flip coordinates, become a little bit of technical. I don't want to bore you. So you flip to argument using the, okay, uh, using one as um, um, you more or less write both solutions um, as graphs, uh, right, with respect to one of the two variables. So anyway, you, you flip the coordinates. Like, I mean, it's, it's not exactly flipping, but let's say you flip the coordinates more or less, you end up with another nice PD. And now you need to concentrate to your tip region. And not the very, like, the, by tip now is uh, the, the set where U is small. U is less than delta, actually. All right? Which is... Uh, this uh, very, very, very close to the tip, you have the soliton. But this is a pretty big region where you don't just see the soliton. All right. And they are now, things change because, of course, you don't have the Gaussian weight anymore because you don't have this operator. So you need, so you, you, you define a new uh, measure, a new weight, uh, which uh, will work. And, of course, it's related to the fact that you have the ball solid on near the tip. And with this new weight, you prove a Poincaré type inequality and a coerc which helps you uh, proving a coercive estimate in the tip. So, okay, this is uh, technical, and you need to, uh, to do it. But what you prove is now that near the tip, because now what is the, you have... You introduce cutoff functions in this region, right? So because of this cutoff function, now you can estimate the difference of your two solutions here in terms of whatever you had there where you do the cutoff functions, right? Because now you can estimate, you can estimate the difference in these new coordinates of the two solutions in terms of wherever you put your cutoff function, which is now included in the intermediate region, back. So you start going back, all right? And so this, you see, so this way you're closing your argument now, right? So you have estimated, I, I, can, know, I can now go back, right? Because I estimate now the tip in terms of the intermediate, the intermediate in terms of the parabolic, and then at the end I show that the parabolic is what wins. Right. I could have even started with this estimate and then go around. So at the end, most importantly, you have now you can isolate WP, which is just the W multiplied by the cutoff function in the parabolic region. And not only that, you know that the only thing that matters is the projection into the curve. 
And of course, now you're in good shape. Um, you, you now concentrate into the parabolic region, and if alpha of tau is just the proje this projection that prevails, you end up with um, an ODE uh, there. And now you may say, okay, but, all right, now you may say, uh, okay, I mean, I, right, so, and now how do you fix your parameters? Okay, obviously you fix one parameter, right, because here you, so you end up with an ODE, right, but to show, you want to show that in, with this ODE, alpha of tau is zero, okay, but, so one of parameters you fix so that at some tau naught that you start, alpha of tau naught is zero, okay? You want the projection, right? Just the, the projection at one point to be zero. This is one parameter. And the other parameter you have fixed before. I told, I, um, uh, the other parameter you have fixed uh, earlier when you prove the coercive estimate, uh, the estimate in the parabolic region that I told you. You have fixed another parameter. It's hidden a little bit. Um, so that you make the projection of into the positive mode at something not equal zero. And there are some technicalities because you have to do it simultaneously at the same time. No. So let me uh, write, uh, explain here. So how do you, so W is U1 minus U2 beta gamma. All right, and you have to choose the beta gamma. So the little claim is that there exists a tau node which is very negative, such that the P plus and N, there exists beta and gamma, some parameters, so that P plus at W at tau node is zero, and P zero of W at tau node equals zero. This is projection into the positive. You have only one eigenvalue, and this is projection into the kernel. All right? I mean, for that, you, we have to work a little bit, because the point is that you want the, okay, it's, it's trivial to find uh, um, that this is true for two different tau nodes, but you have to know that this is true for the same tau node. So that's how you fix the parameters. So once you know that, then you know that alpha of tau naught is zero, okay? And if you didn't know this, you wouldn't be able to prove this estimate because this estimate says that what prevails is the alpha of tau. But you don't know unless you, you, you put this is equal to zero. Okay, so at the end, uh, you end up uh, with an OD, for alpha of tau, okay, which you can, uh, given the fact uh, that uh, alpha of tau is sufficiently small as tau approaches minus infinity, you can integrate and then um, show that uh, for tau sufficiently negative, you have that uh, this is uh, happening for tau, right, given the fact that at some point tau naught is zero, alpha of tau naught is zero. And uh, then you prove the uniqueness. So this is the end of the story. Um, and then uh, this is the estimate that I, um, I I talked to you a little bit, the cylindrical estimate, um, which I think uh, should be true in um, in the non-rotation symmetric case and as well. Um, uh, Robert is an expert on that. Maybe he knows how to do it. I mean, I think I think we know, it's not that difficult to prove that away from the soliton region, um, the thing looks looks cylindrical. And um, so, okay. And um, and um, so, of course, the question here is to show that uh, these ancient ovals uh, are rotationally symmetric. And one way to go about it is to try to show that as t approaches minus infinity, everything is rotationally symmetric. Uh, the, the all possible limits are rotationally symmetric, and then maybe um, try to um, to show that um, um, an idea similar to what Robert um, 
uh, used uh, to show that any translating soliton of the uh, mean curvature flow under the uniform to convex the assumption is uh, the rotation is symmetric. This is a very nice result by Robert, uh, which uh, classifies the uh, shows the rotation symmetry of translating solitons uh, for mean curvature flow under uh, some conditions that they are necessary, otherwise there are other examples. And um, um, so and a related problem for what I discussed, because you know, if you look at the, well, if you want to show that everything is rotation symmetric, you, at some, you will need to also to show that at the tip, you always see something rotation symmetric, which is the, um, um, the translating soliton. And so that's why this uh, work of Robert is, is important, but what is also important is to say that any eternal solution is rotation symmetric, which is an open problem. Not any eternal, this is not true, again, under, uh, very, uh, under the right assumptions. Okay, I will stop here. Sorry, I didn't finish early, as I advertised. You know, to be honest, I want to do it. I wanted to do it because, uh, yeah, I mean, okay. I don't want, I mean, I didn't do it to understand. I mean, if I want to be honest, I didn't do it to understand. The objective motivation is, uh, yes, of course, if we knew how to classify everything, we will, it would be very good. But, of course, this is a lot of work. Uh, yeah, of course, you will be able to classify, uh, you know, to understand better, not to classify, to understand better, uh, better singularities. Because, okay, you, uh, if you know, but of course, it may be this turns out to be, I think, more difficult than other methods to understand singularities. Ah, the, the, the topology, you know, um, uh, you mean a topological appli something application. Ah. For its own sake. Um, uh, I'm sure there are, but uh, but to be honest, I kind of like the the PD uh, the PD sake, uh, but uh, you know the yeah uh, uh, because for the mean yeah you you see you may say okay like okay why do you study all the singularities for the mean curvature flow right yes. 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 Yes, that's the idea. Yes, yes. And this is what Robert did also for the to show the rotation symmetry of the solitons. Because you look at infinity and then you show that okay, you see you see something rotation symmetric and therefore it propagates. So yes, uh, so that's the, that's one that's one uh, one um, one way of going on that. Another way is just to try to show that two things are the same uh, without going through the rotation symmetry. Uh, there could be some magic that uh, will, uh, el some uh, like a little bit more maybe jam, and that will eliminate all this hard work. Yes, uh, this is uh, Brendle has the same. Uh, yes, uh, for three for the charlatan. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. So the equation changes. So the, the what really changes is just the equation changes a little bit, and then the principal curvatures. Yes, they're like uh, 
uh, yeah. So is that is is not so different, but still yes. I can buy yes yes yeah. Uh, no, I mean no no because it's K O K cross A O L. So then they don't. Yeah, and whatever. Yes. Yeah, you still have. So, um, right. So, yes. Yeah, so, and then you have this. We know the mass asymptotics uh, because you can do the formal analysis. It's just the operator, maybe the, 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 the spectrum of the operator is a little different. But, uh, because the operator is a little different. Uh, oh, what, uh, because uh, we believe, yes, definitely. No, but we, we, uh, uh, yeah, no, you, you, I mean, you, you, you think, I think, ah, I think this, uh, Suja one has shown, right, that you have as T approaches minus infinity. Is it right, Robert, that what Suja one shows that uh, you, yes, you see an asymptotic cylinder. So you don't have anything else. Which is good, I think. You may not like it, but I think it's good. <laughs> this is no. The cylinder is no. Who proved it first? Should I one prove it? Or it was? It's no. It's not easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Brian White. I mean, it's not so difficult to see the cylinder as the approach. Is uh, on compact sets, like, uh, you know. 